some of the school children, young men helping to build the A-frame building. And now we have bee culture being taught and introduced to the islands. Babeldaup never had bees before, except very small wild bees. These bees were brought in from the mainland. A queen bee and a few of the workers propagated down in Karor and now brought up to the school grounds in order to start beehives. Instead of using sugar, which would have to be bought, we in inaugurated the beehives. Plenty of mangrove uh, blossoms are there for nourishing uh, and making honey. Here I am trying to do this. I never did it before, but I read the directions and scared to death. These are temporary hives that were brought in just to establish the beginning bees. We were all a little apprehensive, but nobody got stung very much. I got stung a couple of times, which wasn't very pleasant, but could have been worse. A young man just got stung, started to run away. Now we put some protection on the top to keep the wind and rain from blowing them away. Eventually those hives got established when we got the more permanent uh, structures built. In the background you see a new building going up for a dormitory and then the temporary hut in front. These are all temporary shacks. This is the dock and the wharf for the boats to come in. Some of those boats were built locally and we have a few that are plastic boats that were purchased. These structures you see are uh, frames for making a pier to go out to the deep water so you don't have to walk in in the shallows. And these are all made of mangrove logs. And this is excavating there's one of the dormitories almost finished, made of thatch for the roof, bamboo for the sides, woven together, and mangrove logs for the structure. That was a small dormitory, and there are the builders who participated in building it. Students and parents. There's a view of the school from a distance. Here are some students painting, first carving and then painting the facade with the storyboard technique common to Palau. Here's the tank almost finished. Another view of the dock gradually being extended farther and farther out into the bay. Here's a homemade boat coming in. This boat is pulling a raft and on the raft you will notice there are coral heads which are used for making the dock. This is a slow process. The only way we could do it, not having modern equipment and facilities. These big coral chunks are taken from off on the reef. <coughs> Here they are being put in place. Coming off the raft and <coughs> thrown onto the dock. And then later they'll be cut and chiseled and then made into a wall. A 
from morning till night, that raft goes out to the reef way out beyond those island, that island formation out there. <coughs> Brought in probably two trips a day with one raft. Stripping bamboo for making the walls of the dormitories. There's a, just a view of the school from a distance from the bay. There was a tremendous bay there where there were plenty of shellfish and prawns. <coughs> a lot of oysters were being propagated along the edges of that bay. And here's the pier being constructed. Some of the Koror people coming up to visit. People of Koror were somewhat skeptical about the possibility of building this school, and now and then they would come up to see how progress was going and were amazed to see such things as this, the wall made of all those coral heads that came from a half a mile or so out on the reef. Because in, because in Koror they had gotten used to uh, American government handouts and subsidies and uh, various support programs. And there you go the roofing thatch made of nipa palm. This kind of roof provides shelter from the rain and the rays of the sun that cannot penetrate, very fine insulating material. So those dormitories are very cool. The dormitories built on Karor and the school buildings are complete concrete, including the roof, and are very hot. This is Ngerokabatang the chief and spiritual leader of the Modekne people. Inspecting the one of the dormitories. Excavation and footing started for another one. There were 13 of these buildings built. In America now, we hear in colleges and elsewhere of open dormitories, boys and girls all staying in the same quarters, and that was traditionally practice in Palau, so America is catching up. Girls and boys all live in the same dormitory. This is hibiscus fiber being stripped for weaving purposes. There's another dormitory being framed. It was raining during this uh, filming, but people work, if it isn't teeming hard and blowing, people work right through the rain. Now you see the dock almost finished, extended out about a quarter of a mile into the bay. In addition to the stone structure, this wooden structure was built so you could go out even farther. At low tide it was impossible to bring the boats 
uh, big boats all the way into the shore, so we had to extend the dock out to the deep water. That excavation that you see there where the boats are moored was all dug out by hand. Public works men from Koror in the early stages came up to advise on how to do it and they said you would need a, at least what is known as a clam to get in and dig out that material and a bulldozer and it would take months and it would cost thousands of dollars. So we did it in months, but without a cent, just labor. This man is chopping the bark off the mangrove posts. The end of the pier is being constructed. You can see now it extends far out into the bay. chopping the coral to shape it. The wall is built and then it's filled in behind it to provide land. The coral uh, provides a wall that lasts forever. It can't uh, disintegrate solid limestone. A wooden structure is put on the outside of it so the boats don't get marred by the coral. This is a small kitchen being built outside the temporary kitchen. Most of the food uh, which came from the garden included taro, which in Hawaii is called poi. It's a root crop, starch crop, tabioca, which is called cassava in some lands, another starch crop. And then they had sweet potatoes and greens of various kinds. That's the chief of Kyangal, you see there, who came in to help. His name is Relukata. R. Relukata. R. E. L. U. K. A. T. A. Relukata. Here are the women at the opening of the school coming up to celebrate the finishing of the school building. In earlier times, a decade or so ago, these women would all be bare-breasted, but now the influence of Western and Koror and the city life, they're all dressed in Western <coughs> style. Yeah, the old women's dance, name of which escapes me right now, but definitely uh, dated from historic times. These are all mothers of the students who are going to go to the school.
It is customary when this kind of dance is done in celebration of an event that the men like this man who was then the district administrator or any participant comes up to the women and gives them gifts. And here he is coming up dancing and he's giving her a gift, which in this case, Western style, is money. Olden days it would be some handicraft or some other item. Now we have some of the students coming in. Yeah, dressed more in the traditional garb. They are the younger ones who were permitted to take off their tops by the Yerok Batang and the chief so that they could exemplify more of the <coughs> ancient traditions. Here you notice they have mixed some cloth in with the grass skirts in order to give it some color. And you have one girl there with a top on who obviously may have been influenced by a missionary or for some reason didn't want to take off her top. These are younger children. Now we have a war dance by the boys. I don't know what this girl is doing, and it looks like she's doing a laundry on the cellar floor. <laughs> and here is a pig getting ready for the big celebration. Here they are bringing in meat that was slaughtered and then on the dock, as you see here. There were, for this celebration, there were 13 pigs killed, hundreds of chickens, and hundreds and hundreds of fish to feed 2,000 people from Karor and all the villages on the opening day. In my Western style, as one who was helping in this project, I was very concerned how they would ever feed 2,000 2, people but they didn't seem to be bothered. People came up from Kumaroa with big hunks of ice. The night before, the meat was all put in these chests with ice from Kumaroa, because I worried about the meat spoiling if it were uh, slaughtered too soon. That's my little boat coming up from Kumaroa with some of the items for the party. But everything went smoothly. They had plenty of food and some to spare. It took uh, two days to get things ready. Here are all the coconuts being opened and prepared for drinking. You notice the method of husking the coconuts. A wedge is put into the ground made of hard wood and then the husks are taken off. The girls finish up the job. This is firewood for the fires. We had 12 big, enormous kettles used to boil the taro and tabioca. Women bringing in tabioca from their gardens and from the school garden. There are the big kettles left over from Navy days. building a rain catchment trough on the edge of the school building to catch the rain. Paint still painting and putting in the story of the work done on this building. See this girl painting in those figures. Strange as it may seem, later on she had spent a year learning how to do this and finishing it up both these girls were very active and interested in it, so they were the ones that were given the job under the direction of a Palawan and myself. But when she finished, 
She said, I'm interested in art. When am I going to take a course in art? And she already had gone through a year's experience. But stemming from formal education, she felt she had to have a course. It was difficult to instill in the people's minds that learning by doing was uh, as good if not better than merely taking courses. Because these people had been through American elementary education and a year or two of public high school and they could only think in terms of courses. Now all this meat is being prepared for the party. Now this is a throwback to the film that where we're covering the tank. The big water tanks you saw being constructed are underneath this slab. So they're completely sealed except for a manhole which is used to go in now and then and clean the tank. The water for these tanks comes off this vast roof. The only vehicle on this location was my Jeep. And that came quite late during the process of building. You will notice you don't see one outboard motor now. I mean, excuse me, you don't see one outrigger canoe, you see all <laughs> outboard motors. There's a big sign welcoming everyone to the opening day. And people are arriving little by little. This is an old Navy uh, landing craft left over from the Navy, patched up and used for transporting lumber and various items from the village. This did not belong to the school, by the way. That belonged to the government. And they were just bringing passengers up to the celebration. And here comes another M boat, called an M boat landing craft loaded with people for the party. Palawans love parties. If they hear of a party in any village, they'll be there. So it wasn't very difficult to get great hordes of people to our opening day. Many of them were very curious about what had been going on up here in the sticks or up in the boondocks of Babeldao. So they had to come to see because it was very hard for them to believe that the people had built their own school and they wanted to come up and see it and also to have some fun at the celebration. The completed dock and wharf is there and there are the hordes of people coming the chiefs and the celebrities or the high family people are in the front rows getting ready. Tables are all ready. Those are leading men. This gentleman, this young man coming up in the light shirt is Thomas Remengesau, R-E-M-E-N-G-E-S-A-U. He was the district administrator, kind of a governor of the island. There are all the people gathered to hear the speeches. More dancing and celebration of the opening day. Young people doing an old woman's dance, traditional skirts. This was not at the party. This is a, a shot taken during the working day. We had no utensils, but we had some old Navy stainless steel trays, as you see. 
Everybody had to eat with his hands. Another scene from out of my window of my little A-frame house overlooking the bay. There are some of the fields <clears throat> where tapioca was going to be grown, all prepared, ready for planting. This was the road going up to the farms. Here are some women, students, clearing the land for more additional farmland. Some of the land you can see is already cleared, but clearing that forest and jungle to provide land was a horrendous task. This was going to be a taro patch for wet taro. So the mud had to be cleared out, fertilized with leaves, ditches dug for drainage, all by hand. In Palau, in farming, most of the women work in teams. You very seldom see a woman alone, although if it's her own private patch, you may, but community work like this is always done in, in, uh, te on team basis. Here they are getting out one of the tree stumps, which if with modern equipment would have taken five minutes. Is that a mango tree stump? Is that a mango? Pandanus. That's a pandanus uh, tree where the fiber for making baskets and grass skirts come from. This shows some of the terrain before it was prepared for gardens. School in the distance. This was a plateau overlooking the bay. <coughs> Another view of the school, almost completed. And here are parts of the farm areas. Those trees you see in the background unfortunately all went. I grieve to see those beautiful big trees cut down but they had to do it in order to provide food for the students. Some of the most magnificent big trees that have been there hundreds of years were cut and the lumber was used for building purposes and the ground used for farm. There's the red wet taro field you saw being prepared now planted. Wet taro provides what is known in Palau as kukau, K-U-K-A-U, kukau, a starchy root which is boiled, sliced, or sometimes deep fried in coconut oil. There's another view of the bay. Some of the farmland with a school in the distance and a cloud hovering early in the morning. Another view of the school. Preparing more farmland, more wet taro land. See all the taro already planted in the background. What they do is take the mud out like that and then they fill the hole with leaves to provide fertilizer, natural fertilizer and then they take the seedlings which you see bundled up in the front from other taro patches and stick them in the ground like here she is getting ready to put them in and then they grow and make tubers at the bottom, tubers see the leaves being thrown in that provides humus organic fertilizer. This is the leading lady 
who helped on the direct the farming. Mrs. Emma Seol was the name of the leading farmerette or the woman farmer. E M E S I O L. Emma Seol. Actually, in Palawan, it would start with C H E C H E M A S I O L. Emma Seol. That was one of the leading families who helped get the land for this school. Part of the land belonged to the MSCO family. Here come some women who had been working in the field. Students starting the first day of school. School started about, I say about because there is no precise time in Palau. After breakfast at about 8 o'clock, everybody sat, because we had no furniture at this time, sat around in the schoolroom first for an assembly program, and then later went to sections for instruction. And everything was done on the floor, as you see here, because of no furniture. But school started anyway. can see the vast size of the building. No permanent partitions were put in that school. They were all movable partitions so that it would be more versatile to use it for assembly or for smaller classes when needed, office space or whatever. The changes may indicate so you wouldn't have to tear down walls. A very versatile design. Carpenter filing his Japanese saw. very tight joint. At last we got a chainsaw. The chainsaw helped a lot in speeding up a lot of the work. Originally all that cutting had to be done with an adze as you saw in previous uh, illustrations. But finally, we had saved enough money and bought a chainsaw that speeded up the work considerably. Many people thought we were against modern equipment. We weren't against modern equipment. We just didn't have it. But that didn't mean we were going to stop building or that we couldn't build a school. And also, in some cases, modern equipment like bulldozers would be way beyond our means financially. But the point has to be made that not having it should not prevent the doing of something you want to do. It may take longer, more people, more labor, but it can be done. In early American colonial days, perfect example of the many interesting and beautiful structures that were made by hand. We don't want to go back to those days necessarily, but if you don't have it, you do another, do it the best you can. The scientist here, again from the University of Hawaii, teaching something about marine biology and the propagation of shrimp. Here he showing, this is an, a, a picture of the small baby shrimp that he brought to stock our pond after it was finished. The first harvest of the shrimp was about six months later. And then from then on, uh, we tried and were able to make our own uh, egg, uh, propagate by eggs, and uh, I forgot the name, what the little shrimp are called. This is putting organic material in the pineapple field. Native custom ways of agriculture are quite sound in many respects. They always use organic material and mulch and leaves and materials for their farming.